I always thought one of the worst jobs in the world would have to be the complaint department in any kind of business. You just listen to people complain all day long. Whoever does that kind of job must have emotional reserves that I just simply don't have. Complaint after complaint after complaint. I, I, I don't know how they do it. Have you ever been around a chronic complainer? I was thinking about somebody that, that, that finds the negative side of everything. No matter what it is, they have a negative comment. Most of you are sitting there thinking about someone you know right now. We've all experienced uh, this kind of person, and, and most of us know this kind of person. It's more common than we would like it to be. Common enough, in fact, that we have created names for these kinds of people. Negative Nelly, Negative Nancy, Grumpy Gus. I heard a friend uh, call someone like this recently, Bad Attitude Brad. thought that was pretty good. And then who can forget the classic, Debbie? Can't tell you it won't come true. <laughs> I bet he wished for that new Mustang GT he wants. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> if I had a wish, I wish that they'd release that poor hostage in Iraq. <laughs> Sugars we're eating, America's experienced diabetes. <laughs> Guys, I want to say something. It really means the world to have my family here for my birthday. I especially want to thank Uncle Frank for flying all the way in from North Carolina. Uncle Frank! Good thing Jean's out of the picture. Jean? Who's Jean? Hurricane. <laughs> the latest in a string of deadly storms that left thousands of Floridians homeless. They're still counting the fatalities in Haiti. <laughs> ah, Debbie. No matter the situation, she will find a way to kill the vibe. I think we all have a little bit of Debbie in us, but there are some people who find a way to take a negative perspective on everything. It seems that they only see life through dark colored glasses. You know, they, they call it different things, just telling the truth just being a realist. For these people, life is always against them. They can never seem to truly enjoy anything. They got a promotion, but it came with a 3% raise rather than a 5% raise, so it's kind of a bummer. They want an all-expenses-paid vacation, but the flight took longer than they expected, so they couldn't really enjoy the trip. They're more fortunate than most out there, but it's no good because the trivial things that go wrong every day dominate their perspective. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but even groups of people can take on this complaining disposition. In our text today, the people of Israel are being a bunch of Debbie Downers, and God, through his prophet Isaiah, is going to call them on it. We continue in our questions from God series this morning, week seven, and we'll be in Isaiah chapter 40, if you'd like to go ahead and turn there now. Throughout the history of the Old Testament, we see over and over again the people of Israel turning away from God, following after their own way. God used judges and priests and especially prophets to warn them that doing that would not end well for them. He told them over and over again, if you don't repent, if you don't repent, if you don't repent, I'm going to blow the whole thing up. Of course, they didn't listen. So after the death of King Solomon, the kingdom was divided. You had Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And after hundreds and hundreds of years of disobedience, eventually um, Assyria invaded the northern kingdom of Israel and carried off many of the Israelites into captivity uh, in Assyria. And then later, Babylon invaded and conquered the southern kingdom, carrying off the citizens of Judah into bondage in Babylon. The wall of Jerusalem was torn down. The temple was destroyed. The temple furnishings were looted and thousands and thousands of Jews were taken captive and forced to live in a foreign land. So by the time we get to Isaiah chapter 40, the prophet is living in exile in Babylon. And he's looking ahead to a day when perhaps the people of Israel, God's people, 
will be allowed to return to their homeland. Amidst the consequences of their disobedience and the collective destruction that they've experienced, there's still hope. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27 says, Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God? This is our question for the morning. Why do you complain? Well, the people of Israel complained because they felt that God had abandoned them. They felt that he didn't care about their troubles, about their problems. God had always told them, I'm your God and you're my people. You're my child whom I brought out of slavery in Egypt. I'll guide you and protect you. I'll provide for you. I'll never leave you. And they believed it. The problem was in their belief, they got to the point where they began to take advantage of God's grace and his love. I think we can do this sometimes too. God's grace and his mercy become so commonplace, so accessible, so assumed that we take them for granted. I think sometimes we can subconsciously even use them as an excuse to sin. That's what happened with Israel. God brought correction to them in the form of invasion and destruction, and they complained. Our way is hidden from him. He's left us. He's turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to our troubles. Do you ever feel this way? That God is far away, that he's given up on you, that he's disregarded your cause, that you can, uh, you can identify with the people of Israel here when they say, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. God asks Israel, why do you complain? There are different types of complaints. There are different types of people who make a habit of complaining. In an article posted earlier this year, the Daily Health Post identifies the three most common types of complainers or negative thinking people. The first most common type of complainer is a venter. This is what the Daily Health Post said about venters. They're people who only want to be listened to. They typically look for someone to listen to their complaints, but they're quick to shut down solutions, even when it's good advice. They don't really want their problem to be solved. They just want to complain about it. And if you give them good advice, right, well, here's how they don't want to hear it. They just want to vent. The second most common type of complainer is sympathy seeker. Daily Health Post says these kinds of complainers always one up your misery. They always, always have it worse than you. And they're quick to see the fault in every situation and in other people. They play the blame game. The third most common type of complainer is a chronic complainer. Now, these people, they obsessively think and complain about a problem. You know, most of us, when we feel like we're carrying something, we want to complain about it for a minute. We need to vent for a minute. We get it off our chest. We feel better. We're able to move on. These people, the opposite effect takes place. Instead of feeling relaxed after complaining, they actually become more worried and more anxious from the act. And so it's a self-perpetuating cycle that causes them to become chronic complainers. You know, the Lord didn't say, don't complain, but he asked Israel why they complained. The Bible's full of examples of people bringing their troubles to God, even venting and and, and complaining to God. Sometimes we need to vent. Sometimes we need other people to identify with us and encourage us in our troubles. And sometimes we need to complain for a minute. No one never complains. But we have to be careful that we don't fall prey to constant negative thinking. There's a difference between complaining and being a complainer. But we can get discouraged and tempted to complain when our prayers go unanswered. If you haven't experienced the feeling of praying for something, hoping for it, pouring your heart and your soul out to God, only to feel that the prayer went unanswered, that it was unheard or disregarded, honestly, you probably don't pray enough because we have all experienced this feeling. All Christians experience being in an unfavorable circumstance at one point or another, most of us have, have dealt with the feeling of not having our prayer heard or, or answered. People in scripture experience the same thing. You know, skeptics claim 
that if God saw the devastation of the world from natural disasters or, or the grave evils that humans enact on one another, that if God really cared about people, he would prevent suffering. And look around, there's suffering everywhere. So the obvious conclusion is that God hasn't heard people's cries or that he doesn't care or that he perhaps can't do anything about it. This is a faithless perspective. The people of God are called to a higher understanding than this. The truth is that God's all-encompassing knowledge, compassion, and power are on display regularly in our broken world if we have eyes to see it. We don't know why bad things happen, why some evils persist and others are stopped, why bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people, why sometimes God seems to intervene, sometimes he doesn't. But here is a foundational truth of the Christian life and one you must come to grips with if you're going to live with faith in a faithless world. Following Jesus sometimes means embracing mystery. Following Jesus sometimes means embracing mystery. God's thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. We can't understand his thoughts. We can't map out his strategies. God is God and we are not. And there are some situations in life that you just have to say, it's a mystery, but I trust God. Jim Dennison writes, I don't know why God sometimes intervenes in natural disasters and sometimes doesn't. I don't know why he sometimes heals and sometimes doesn't, but I know that our father redeems all he allows. I know that he suffers with us and loves us unconditionally. And I know that one day this broken world will be gone and we will live in a new heaven and a new earth. Until that day, I choose to trust what I don't understand to the God who does. Will you join me? And the reality for Israel is that they had disobeyed God. Not once, not twice, not three times, over and over and over again for generations. And like a good parent, God knew, even though I'm sure he didn't want to, he knew that he had to correct them. Because that's what a loving parent does. They correct their children. God loves us enough to do the same. Sometimes the pain and challenges we experience are a result of our sin, our choices, or even just living in a broken world. These things aren't God's fault. They're humanities. We brought sin and death into the world. We perpetuate these things. But in God's grace, he calls us to partner with him in undoing it. Some people just want to blame God. Poet Ilya Kaminsky imagines the trial of God. She writes, at the trial of God, we will ask, why did you allow this? And the answer will be an echo. Why did you allow this? Perhaps we might need to let our own complaints echo in our ears. It's not God who sleeps and puts off and procrastinates and makes excuses. It's us. Israel brought destruction upon themselves and then they complained that God had turned his back on them, that evil persists in the world, not because of God, because of us. But the good news is that we are invited to cast our cares upon the Lord. God allows us to complain, to ask questions, to bring our doubts and our fears and our uncertainties the good news is that we can tell God what's on our heart and there is no complaint, no concern, no grievance that can shock God. Whatever's on your heart, however you're feeling, you have permission to bring him that thing. That thing that, that you wouldn't share with anyone else. You couldn't tell your parents, you couldn't tell your spouse that feeling or concern that no one would understand you can bring that to God. He will understand when no one else could understand. He will listen with grace when no one else could listen with grace. He will be for you what no one else can. And this was true for the Israelites too. The problem is not that they're bringing their complaints to God. We're invited to bring our complaints and our cares to God. The problem is that they fail to recognize how the thing they're complaining about is their doing. 
They blame God for being absent in their suffering, but they fail to see that their situation is a result of their decisions. They don't want to take responsibility for their choices, their actions. They, they just want God to show up and fix their mess. The Israelites wanted God to to turn back the other nations to help them resist Assyria and Babylon. They didn't have the awareness to recognize that it was God who had brought Assyria and Babylon to their gates and that he did it for their ultimate good. They also failed to recognize how God can work in and through them. They didn't see that their troubles, their problems, their correction was merely a chapter and the greater story of God's love and his redemption. And this is what we have to come to terms with in our own lives as well. We make decisions that sometimes necessitate correction from God. We ought not to be afraid or despair. We know that God corrects those whom he loves like a good father. When we face suffering, sometimes it's simply God helping us to get back on the path that he wants us to walk. We have to give him the opportunity to work in our lives and to trust that he knows what's best. It's faith that helps us understand that suffering is only a chapter. And the story is far from over. Faith gives us a new perspective we can bring God the negative, but we need to then hear God's perspective and allow, allow him to trade out our negative for his positive, to trade out our faithlessness for his faithfulness, our anxiety for his peace, our despair for his joy. Let's read our verse this morning in its context and notice how God gives the Israelites a different perspective. They're complaining, they're upset. God says, lift up your eyes. And look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. I don't know about y'all, but I cannot read that passage without thinking about the scene from Remember the Titans. Y'all remember that when they called the team meeting and Louis Elastic and Rev Harris start singing through that. Even yous grow tired and weary. Y'all remember that? Anyway, if you haven't seen Remember the Titans, I don't know where you've been for the last 20 years, but you have homework this afternoon. Anyway, this is the true perspective, the, the perspective that we have to cultivate in our, in our minds and in our thought life. God never promises easy answers. He never promises that, that, that our problems will go away. He, he never promises smooth sailing, but he promises that he is with us and that there's a purpose in the pain. There's a strategy in the suffering. The reality is that life's challenges and trials enrich our faith. The apostle James writes, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is the perspective we must take when we face suffering in our lives. We can complain for a minute. It's, it's important to let yourself vent. Sometimes we need that, but, but we have to move quickly to solutions. We have to let God shape our view of our situation and have the awareness that he is working all things together for our good. We cannot allow ourselves to be caught in an unhealthy thought life, wallowing in negativity, fear, anxiety, doubt. Negativity is like a drug. It tempts you more and more and more to focus on problems rather than solutions. And before you know it, you start to see the negative side of everything. 
in life. Your thoughts translate to actions and your actions influence your life. This is why the ability to take a faith-filled perspective on any situation, in any circumstance, is key to living a life of spiritual maturity and joy. Craig Rochelle says, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. What we think shapes who we are. He goes on to say that there is a war going on in our minds all the time. And that if we want to win this war, we have to be willing to rewire our thought patterns, rewire our brains. Every Tuesday morning here at the church, we have staff meeting. And uh, it's the responsibility of one of our staff members to bring a short devotional to share. A couple of weeks ago, our worship pastor in the celebration service, Eric McElhaney, brought the devotion. And Eric spoke about the difference between ruts and trenches. Ruts are things that are made by accident, naturally, by the normal, everyday operations of life. Trenches are dug intentionally for a purpose. Neuroscience teaches us that our thoughts create neural pathways in our brains. The more we think the same thoughts, the easier it is for our brain to send that same message again. So the more of the same kind of thought we think, the more of a pathway that is created for that same kind of thought to travel through our brain again. Negative thoughts are like ruts. No one intends to create them. They just get naturally formed by the business of everyday life. We don't actively think negative thoughts. They just come naturally as part of our fallenness and our brokenness. But the more we resign ourselves to them, the deeper they dig themselves in. We unintentionally create ruts when we complain, when we focus on the negative, when we dwell on the past, when we play the doomsday reel of failure in our lives, when we replay the wrongs of others. Negative thoughts over and over and over again, they create ruts. Ruts have no true purpose and they require repair. Positive thoughts, on the other hand, faith-filled thoughts, hopeful thoughts, peaceful thoughts are like trenches. They don't get formed naturally. They have to be worked on. They require consistent, intentional effort and attention. When we take our thoughts captive, we make them obedient to Christ. When we choose trust over fear, when we allow God to shape our perspective, it's like digging trenches and the pathways of our minds. Trenches are purposefully dug. They deliver vital resources. They have a purpose. Eric's key line that morning was, ruts are where lies live, but trenches are filled with God's truths. We get stuck in ruts, but trenches carry life. So I want to challenge you this week, because every day has its own troubles. Every day has its own reasons to complain. When you're tempted to think a negative thought, to be fearful or anxious, think about the ruts and the trenches. Remind yourself of God's truth. Take every thought captive through the Holy Spirit, subject it to the Lordship of Jesus, who for your sake has defeated darkness and death, and reconciled you to God by the blood of the cross. We will face troubles and trials, but God is with us and he has a purpose for our lives. I'll close this morning with Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of our passage from today. Why would you ever complain, O Jacob, or whine, Israel, saying God has lost track of me? He doesn't care what happens to me. Don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. He lasts. He's the creator of all you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out, doesn't pause to catch his breath, and he knows everything inside and out. He energizes those who get tired, gives fresh strength to dropouts. For even young people tire and drop out. Young folk in their prime stumble and fall. But those who wait upon God get fresh strength. 
They spread their wings and they soar like eagles. They run and they don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the ministry of the prophet Isaiah, the ways in which he ministered to Israel in his day and the ways in which he ministers to us and ours. God, I pray that you would help us to live out the calling of this passage, that you would help us to lean into the reality that negative thoughts create a negative disposition. Help us to rewire our brains and our thought patterns to mitigate the complaints, to live a life of gratefulness and faith, to trust that we are in your hands and that you're working all things together for our good. God, give us that fresh perspective. Help us to wake each morning with the strength to face the day, the troubles it holds, knowing that you are with us and that you're always, always going to protect us and provide for us and do what's best for us. Help us to trust you when we don't understand. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd stand, we're going to have... In Jesus' name, amen.